Hi, my name is Keeman Rowe, Assistant to Mayor Betsy Price and Program Director for Steer Fort Worth, and I'd like to welcome you all to the Mayor's Monthly Luncheon Series. The series is a partnership with the Fort Worth Hispanic Chamber's Latino Young Professionals Group in Steer Fort Worth to allow young people to have access to key community leaders in our community. Today is special for a number of reasons. First, it's the last day to vote, so if you aren't registered, then you need to have a conversation with me. Second, later tonight, Steer Fort Worth will give an update to the City Council on our community projects and plans for next year. I encourage you all to make it out if you can. The council meeting starts at 7 p.m. Third, today is the final installment of this year's luncheon series. But don't worry, we'll be back next year. We actually have Matt Rose, George P. Bush, and many others, just to name a few, that'll be on our roster next year. And before we get started today, we need to recognize a few folks that have been integral in making the luncheon series a success. First, Mayor Betsy Price for supporting us youngins. <laughs> uh, Congresswoman Granger and for taking the time to visit with us today. Thank you. Um, the Fort Worth Hispanic Chamber and LYP, Mari and Rachel are here to represent. Um, and then today's sponsor, TXU, Lacey, can you stand up to be recognized, please? Lacey's going to have an amazing announcement um, to make later on in the program, and which we'll be really excited about. And then finally, I'd like to um, give a thanks to our host today, Dr. Peggy Watson from the John V. Roach Honors College for hosting us today. I have fond memories of my time here at TCU, and Dr. Watson played an integral part in me coming here. Um, but the fact is, um, it's just a huge privilege to actually introduce you, Dr. Watson. Um, you're one of my favorite people here at TCU. And she literally built the honors program from the ground up. Before I introduce Mayor Price, I'd also like to add that I come to you today, not only as the Dean of the Honors College, but also as a professor of Spanish and Hispanic studies here at TCU. So if you'll allow me one quick indulgent a ustedes que hablan español, les doy la bienvenida, eh? bienvenidos a la universidad. That was a pleasure, that was a pleasure. Um, my great pleasure for the day and my reason for being here is indeed to introduce Mayor Betsy Price. I'm sure she, well, she may know this now because we sat at the table and talked about it, but she and I are actually friends on Facebook. I am one of her 500,000 friends. <laughs> and I've realized that she uses this medium very astutely, not only for communicating information, but also for bringing residents into an understanding of city government. And she has now given me permission to also say that, that my husband is her orthopedic surgeon because of her shoulder. So we actually have many connections, many, many, many connections. She is aptly nicknamed the Texas Tornado and has probably met more citizens personally than any mayor in the city's history through her personal appearances on bicycle with her helmet on in Fort Worth's many neighborhoods. Through her, all of us have entered an era of true representation at the highest levels of local government, and we thank you for that. Please welcome our 44th mayor and the pride of Fort Worth, Mayor Betsy Price. What Peggy failed to tell you is that she also had children at Pasco when I was PTA president and she worked like a dog for us. So I appreciate that, Peggy. It's great to see you. And Keith did a great job. I can, you know, put my arm anywhere I want to now. So watch out. I might get after you. <laughs> you just never know. It's always so fun to see y'all at our monthly luncheons. We've just had great series, don't you think? Everybody, LYP, Keeman, Misty, all of my staff, Mary Ann, Jason, have all worked so hard, but each of you has worked so hard. I'm still getting tremendous feedback from the community on your presentations, and Council's excited about hearing you tonight. I told them they're limiting your presentations on time, but I want you to have enough time. I want, remember, you're taped tonight. You'll go live, it'll go out live on cable, and then it'll show over and over, so... If you want to go back and watch yourself, find the cable channel. 
But, you know, you all are just doing a great job. The energy and enthusiasm, it is so widespread that when I was in Dubai last week, we were at a dinner with the AmCham, which is the American Chamber. We had businesses there from Exxon, Lockheed, AT&T, Raytheon, the Perot Group, the Perot's Alliance Group. And one topic came, led to another, and finally one of the guys said, what we really want to know is about your young leaders group. We're hearing about your Steer Fort Worth group everywhere we go. And I said, yes, I'm just like a mother with a proud. I will puff my chest out and say I'm very proud of my young folks, and they're doing a great job. So you are to be commended for your commitment to this. Uh, I'm going to introduce Kay in just a minute, but Kay, I'm going to take a little time to let Lacey come up and thank her, TXU, for being with us today. So would you like to come up and say a few words? Thank you. Thank you, Miss Lacey. And thank everyone for being here. It's been such a just an honor to work with you guys, Steer Fort Worth and also the Latino Young Professionals. Um, a week ago, I met with um, a bunch of folks and we came up with a really great idea that we not only wanted to sponsor today's luncheon, but we wanted to take it a step further and um, come up with something really cool for all of you to um, help us give back in a really neat way. And what we came up with is for every like on our TXU Energy in Your Community Facebook page, I've committed to donating a tree to the Steer Fort Worth Urban Development Committee or the task force um, for them to use on future projects. And so please get your phone out, like our page. And, and la before I checked, or, or excuse me, before I came into the room, we were at 56 trees and these aren't little trees. They're 100 pound, 30 gallon, huge trees. Whatever species you want, I can even get you fruit trees. So um, go like our page. It is our community page. So search for TXU Energy in your community and um, simply like the page and I'll tally up the numbers um, at the end of the day today. And I also just want to um, thank the lovely women that I'm sitting with today. Um, you too guys, but um, it's such a privilege to be with our Congresswoman and um, our Mayor and, and Dr. Watson. So thank y'all so much for everything that you do. Um, I was in Midland the other day with Congressman Conaway, and he actually commended you um, for everything that you're doing right now with, well, I won't go into details, but um, with Libya and all the stuff going on. And so I just appreciate the service that we do here in the Fort Worth community. It really does impact not only our state, but the world, as the mayor just mentioned. And um, I just can't be more excited to work with each of you. So thank you and go like our page. Thank you, Lacey. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, now you know you don't generally get to have your phones out during meetings like this, so get them out and like them. We can use the trees. J.D., we might put them on the river on your project somewhere. J.D.'s got his phone out. If you don't know, do you remember J.D. Granger that you had the opportunity to hear at J.D.'s office? That's been several months ago. The River Vision Project's moving along nicely. It's my honor today to get to introduce my friend, Congresswoman Kay Granger to you. Kay is the only other mayor, a woman mayor of Fort Worth. It's just the two blondes, as somebody said the other day. <laughs> she may not want to claim that, but I'll take it. I was at the post office one day and some woman was going on, oh, Congresswoman Granger. I said, no, I'm Betsy Price. Oh, 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 okay. And she went on and on it and finally I said, no, I'm Betsy Price. She said, you're the other blonde. So, <laughs> Nobody works harder for Fort Worth and, and her district, which goes clear up into Parker County, than Congresswoman Granger does. Kay is a true asset for us. She's on defense and appropriations, too many committees to name. She's solely responsible for helping us keep the uh, C-130s here, which would have been a terrible mistake. Kay works actively on behalf of all of us, particularly in defense, in all the jobs and in the quality of life, the bills coming out of Washington, this is not an easy time for Kay to be working. It's a very partisan committee, but she is committed to continue to serve this committee, this community. And you will not find anybody who works more hours. She was talking about the USS Fort Worth. If you haven't had the chance to see the commissioning pictures from the USS Fort Worth in Galveston, they were incredible, and the sole reason between Garden England and Kay is why we have the USS Fort Worth. But she left there and went to Georgia, and I'm thinking, well, that's not too bad, but she's not in Georgia 
not Atlanta, Georgia, but out of the country. In Russia, essentially you said you got tired of telling people and said I went to Russia. She travels tirelessly so that we can stay abreast of what's going on and so she can keep, help keep things level and moving for you. A lot of the decisions that Kay's been instrumental in making will directly impact your life and your futures and the quality of our life here. And I'm pleased to call Kay my friend. So help me welcome Congresswoman Granger today. Thank you, Kay. Appreciate it. It's good to see you. Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, inviting me to be with you. I'm very excited about this group, and I, I'm one of the ones that knew about it and would ask about it. And it's so important that you're taking this interest and in really in your community, and, and it's so important to this community that you're engaged. We need leadership at every level, and this is a very dynamic um, community. And your dynamism is what we need here today, and we have it, so thank you. We've, for too long, I've felt like that we, you have to sort of be of a certain age to be a leader in Fort Worth. And I waited kind of long. Uh, my kids, I decided to get them the best way I could get to, up to about high school before I got involved in, in politics. And I ran for the city council, which was truly my, that was, I was going to serve on the city council for two terms. That was the extent of my political involvement. And I ran against a man that was quite a bit older than I was. And the question was, was I old enough? And so it always said, K Granger, 47. Now, not, there's not another person in the room that think that 47 is too young to be involved in something. But that was that because of the man that I was running against and was older. So we really need, we need your enthusiasm. We need your new ideas and your good ideas. And so that's uh, very important. I'm going to use my time to lobby you on an issue that's important, I think important, um, going on in Washington. And I think it's one of probably one of the least understood issues that we face. We have a battle going on about spending in Washington. Everyone knows that. We've overspent. You can't argue that we shouldn't cut spending when you have a $16 trillion debt that we're leaving to you and to your children. So it is a huge issue. But from, like they talk about, the 35,000-mile view, it's a battle not on, only about spending, but how much government we want and what we're willing to pay for that government. And it's a battle, and you're seeing that played out in this election. There's a true difference in opinion about how much government is enough or too much. And there are people who are perfectly willing to pay more for more government. And they think that it's, it is important that we have government that's involved in so many of our issues. I sit on the side of, of cutting spending and cutting government because I think our federal government is so large that it's so unwieldy that some of the issues that you think you can take on are so difficult just to get things moving because there's so many layers of government. Even someone as senior as I am in the Congress, it's very difficult to get done. And so you, everything turns into a battle. And you're seeing that played out in this election. And I think it is a good argument or, or, or battle to have to let people think through this. How much government do we want? And what does government need to do and do well? So in this time of change, I want to talk about some of those challenges that we face from Washington, challenges that could impact the growth, the development, and the prosperity of our nation, and is, of our state, and also of this community. Everyone knows that Congress uh, needs to cut spending, and we have been. And we said we're going to cut spending. In fact, the goal was cut spending back to the level that we had in 2008. And we passed a budget that did that, and we passed spending bills that did that. And we'll cut even more after we go back from the election. And those cuts have been supported on a bipartisan basis. Not completely, because people disagree, disagree on where those cuts should be, but we cut programs and we cut agencies, and it is a time to really prioritize and say, what should remain? What should be beefed up? What should be cut? I, as, as the mayor said, I serve on the defense appropriations. I was the first woman ever in the history of the Congress to serve on that because we get to make decisions about planes and ships, and there was a long time where people didn't think that women could make decisions about ships and planes, and so we had education, health care. But now we, that's a different situation. 
We're facing enormous, enormous cuts in defense. Well, if I say, what does a government do well and what should be the first priority of government, it's to keep us safe. It's to keep us safe. I said that when I ran for mayor. I said we had a very serious crime issue in Fort Worth. And I said, people deserve a safe city. That is a responsibility of government. We deserve a, sa a safe nation. We deserve a, an army, a navy, equipment that allows us to be safe. And so those cuts, I'll fight every way I can because we did cut defense spending. We cut it a lot. And that was when um, Secretary Gates was the Secretary of Defense. We cut down to a level that is risky but defensible. If we cut again, it's too far. I think we do, at a time like this, we do look at spending. And you may have paid attention to something that happened recently because I serve on the defense appropriations, I serve on the health care subcommittee, and I chair the uh, subcommittee that funds all the State Department and all of our contributions and involvement with other countries. And when the uprising occurred in Egypt and in Libya, then we put said, let's look at everything we fund to those countries, every single thing, and then look at those very carefully. I have, because I chair that, that subcommittee, we f say, all right, this is what the F State Department can fund, but the spending that goes to other countries has to come through me. So they send me a notification that we want this much money dedicated to, in this case, it was Egypt, $450 million. And when it came to me, I said no, because we watched in the embassies, in our embassies in Libya, embassy in Egypt, we saw some Egyptians really trying to burn down our embassy and take over that embassy and people, our people were at risk. And part of the law that goes along with embassies is the country of Egypt, when we have our, our embassy there, it's their responsibility to keep it safe. It's their responsibility. And they didn't do that. They were slow in responding. So I said, when we're looking at this, and they're in a serious, serious economic uh, crisis, very serious because most of their economy was um, uh, visitors. And so who is going to visit Egypt right now? Well, they're not. So all of that income is gone. So the response came to me to release $450 million for Egypt, and I said no. We, when we do that, we're saying, this is what, how we're helping, and this is what we expect. And they didn't respond to what we expect. So I said, no. And I looked at all of the funding, and we always do, all of it. And you constantly look at that. We don't just send money. So we're, we're holding spending, and we're pulling it back. And we have to keep doing that. We have to keep doing it. We will, after the election, when we go back, we will next year. Businesses are, are cutting their spending. They're watching everything they do, and you know that, the businesses that you work for. Fewer business trips, more teleconferencing, fewer equipment and supplies. Uh, I owned a business for 23 years, and I know the sacrifices particularly small business makes. And so if I owned that business day, I would be looking, like I always did, but look at everything you spend. That's what we have to do. And I would perhaps cut some things that I had done in the past, maybe advertising. But I wouldn't cut my contribution to my IRA. Now you say, well, what, what does that mean? Well, there's a difference. And one thing I'm investing in my future, there's investment and there's spending. Same is true in the government. There's investing and there's spending. And I want you to think with me about the difference because it's very important as we go further. Investment in infrastructure is an investment. If I say I'm going to have funding and I want to put the K Granger Institute in my city and name it for myself, and bill that, that's spending. That's spending and it's for my, to, something that I'm saying, I wanna do that for my own credit. That's spending, the, the bridge to nowhere. Remember the bridge to nowhere? Well, actually it went somewhere, but it didn't go to somewhere that we think the rest of the, of the country thought deserved that sort of spending. However, if you're talking about investments, then let's look at what investments are. I think investments are things like infrastructure that's looking at a growth for our community, a growth for the economy, and creating good jobs. 
local examples of good investments, the Trinity River Vision. Now, why would I say that? Well, because it creates 16,000 jobs. It increases our tax base by $1.1 billion. It creates 2,400 acres of flood control and develops 800 acres in our inner city. Now, having been a mayor, we know what, what we go through as mayors and communities as we grow. And for such a long time, we grew and we didn't want like our shopping in downtown. We wanted things on the outskirts. And so we built out. And what happened? Inner cities collapsed. And that we looked at that at a time when Fort Worth was having a very hard economic time and said, we said, if we're gonna build, do we wanna build a, a highway so people can live outside of our city? Or do we wanna make sure that our inner city is, is dynamic and developed? If you have 800 acres in the middle of your city that you're not having to build highways to that has gone undeveloped or underdeveloped for 40 years, I call that an investment. DFW Airport, all the development happens around DFW Airport. What an enormous investment that was. What a great return we got. And I don't think there's anyone who's lived in the Dallas-Fort Worth area that wouldn't point to DFW Airport. It's a huge dynamic engine that helped our growth and brought companies to the Metroplex because of that wonderful airport that was really in the heart of the country he could fly to either of our uh, coasts. And so they said, this is where we need to do business because we can get our goods and services in and out so quickly and so well. So it was a terrific return on our investment for jobs um, and for support. So the DFW Connector, for instance, is a project that's a great example of that. It's a, a billion dollar investment. It'll make it safer and easier and faster to go to the airport. Roadways will be 20 lanes wide. This is an investment in our future. Think about if you haven't traveled from Fort Worth to Austin recently, or within the last five years, or 10 years, or 15 years. An investment in making that highway safe and efficient would be a huge, huge investment in our future, and it has to be done because as you know, it's named one of the most congested. In fact, they call it the highway of death, I believe. That's, I think my son said that the last time I said I'm gonna drive to Austin. And, and so that's an investment in our future. So think about spending and think about in, in investments. Now, when it comes to something like that, it says on infrastructure projects, they have to be congressionally directed funding. In other words, the community says we have this need and this need can be filled this way, and we'll support it. So almost all those projects have a federal funding and a local funding, a matching funding. And we have to then say, is it feasible? Is there a good return on the investment? Is it locally supported? And all of that has to occur before it can have congressional funding, and that's the way it should be. Beyond those infrastructure projects, there's so many congressionally directed funding. It means the Congress directs this to be spent on things that we take for granted that you probably never realize they happened that way, like the mapping of the human genome started as a $5 million congressionally directed funding. Because some scientists came and said, we think we can do this. And we can do this in this period of time. But there is this much investment that needs to be made on the front end to see if this can happen. And the Congress directed that funding. The Predator drone began, began congressionally directed funding. It's now one of our most critical weapons. Because I've served on defense, I've had the opportunity for people to bring me ideas and say, we think we're onto something that can make our nation safer can equip our military. And so what I do, if, I, if I'm in a position, look at that, I look at it myself, I do some study, then I go to the Defense Department and say, this project was brought to me. Are you aware of it? Would you want the Congress to fund this, to see as seed money? And they say yes. A Texas company came to me, and they could do holographic imaging 
that could be used for our troops so that instead of taking using uh, a monitor that just showed a flat screen, they could see it essentially in 3D. And guess how they used it? To find bin Laden. And I have that holograph in my office. They brought it to give back to me, to keep in my office, as long as I'm in Congress, show other people. that way. So they could see that compound. They could see all the rooms. They could see movement. And they saw it in a, in a 3D, is what I would call it. Uh, we also um, funded, in this way, an advanced gun mount. Another Texas company came to me and said, we have such a problem we have with friendly fire or with going into the areas we're going into now and said we have a weapon that can be used around corners but we need the seed money to get it started again i went to the defense department and said is this something you're interested is does this does this fill a need that is not being met and they said absolutely and so we did that. We funded it for one year. We got them off the ground. The Defense Department then took it over, and it's used by our troops today. So we have this congressionally funded examples in, in national defense, certainly in health care, great deal in health care, in, in the economy. It's not short-term spending. To me, it is an investment, an investment if there is a need. Um, I'm telling this because that doesn't exist anymore. We could do that, but we can't do it anymore. And it came about because of the bridge to nowhere, when people said, this is outrageous. They're just spending, and they, they're spending for things that we wouldn't approve of. And so we said, all right, let's look at the process. Let's look at the process and make changes to the process that will allow that to happen, but also have safeguards so that you don't have the bridge to nowhere or other things that what you really couldn't stand up and say, yes, this was a need that couldn't be filled any other way. And so that's what we were supposed to do. We put a moratorium on those congressional funded um, projects, except we never did any reform. We said we're going to reform it. We never did reform it. Instead, it was lost. And here's what's lost. What's lost is particularly our investment in infrastructure. Now, it didn't cut spending. What it did is it took the responsibility and the oversight away from an elected member of Congress and instead gave it to the administration, any administration. And so, for instance, the funding for flooding that I got from Halt for Haltom City, because they had an enormous flooding problem, that the city of Haltom City could not afford to do on their own, no doubt about it. And so I could do that, and I went out there and looked at it. I brought in people to look at it. We, well, I lost that ability to do that. Now, the day that someone introduces me to the person in the administration who went to Haltom City, or even knows where Haltom City is and understands their flooding problem, then I may change my reaction to it. But they haven't done that. Or Springtown, or Alvarado, um, where this, particularly in the smaller cities, the first time we did away, from this, did away with this congressional funding, it was 75% of the funding went to five cities. And they were the five largest cities because they had the staff to ask for that and to lobby for it. And so New York and, and Los Angeles and, and almost no Texas city. I think there weren't any Texas cities in the top ones. So the process is wrong. It needs to be reformed, certainly. And the Reformation to me says it does it like we've been doing it, frankly, here in Fort Worth. And says, is there a need? What is the need? How important is it? How much local participation is there? Is the public aware of it? And does it have a national response? For instance, Tower 55. Huge issue, huge issue on the busiest, it may have been the busiest in the country. Railroad intersection. Well, it was primarily that railroads are not passenger railroads. They're cargo. And so unless you're in the railroad business, you probably didn't know about that. But it had gone on forever, and those trains were backed up. They, because it was not big enough to handle it, they weren't just backed up in Fort Worth or just in Texas. They're backed up all over the nation because of that problem. And it took a lot of work, a lot of lobbying by the mayor, a lot of bringing people together for them to say, yes, we need to fix that. It's an infrastructure problem. So I'm saying if we don't have that process, then how do we respond to things like highways? Or water projects 
to, to take care of the 200,000 people in Fort Worth who weren't here when I was mayor. They, from the time that I left, the time Mayor Price came in, 200,000 new people. And they all have 200,000 needs. And how do we respond to that? So I think that we need to, again, take care of those issues. But we also need to make sure that we understand we're making an investment. And when we're doing that in the infrastructure, fixing our bridges, putting our roads, putting a, to work 800 acres of inner city, then that's an investment in our future. And I think sometimes in this election we're going through right now, that argument over how much government we have or need are willing to spend, we're not making the case for investments versus spending. And to me, an investment in your nation and in your community is saying, I feel good about it. I want to be a part of the future. We had a bond election here that failed when I was on the city council before I was mayor. And it was a shock to us. We don't have bond elections that fail because we put them together very carefully to be able to explain to the public, to be able to say, this solves a need, this is the way we're financing it. And they're very carefully put together with a lot of public meetings to go out and talk to people and say, this is why we're asking for this permission. And when we do that then, people say, I believe in Fort Worth and I'm gonna vote for that. I believe in our future and I think we should be preparing for our future. When it failed, we were all said, ooh, what happened to us? And so we step back and look at, did we really explain it to the people? No, not really, not like we should have. Was it something that they put at the top of their needs? No, not really at that time. And so we really examine that. I watch bond elections in some of the smaller cities. They have a lot of trouble passing a bond election. So therefore, the roads aren't as good and their schools aren't as good. But I think if we believe in the future, if, if I want to prepare the future in Fort Worth for my grandchildren, for your children, then, then let's, let's pay attention to that. I was in one of my trips, because I also, and through some, my subcommittee, do all the funding for Israel. And we're very supportive of Israel, and you know that's the best ally we've got in the Middle East, one of the only allies we've got in the Middle East, and we work very closely together. And I was on a visit to Israel, and talking about the funding, we have an unusual re uh, relationship with, e uh, with Israel because we actually have a contract with Israel. We said we will fund to this amount, this, uh, this alliance that we have because you're keeping things safe in the Middle East. And so it's a contract. And so I was over there to review the contract and some of the problems we have, for instance, with Egypt said, there's also Egypt is there and said, they'll also be an ally of Israel and we're watching very carefully if they don't. And the mayor of Jerusalem is a very dynamic, one of the most dynamic politicians I've met in a long time. He's just full of energy. He was a, a, a businessman and ran for mayor. And Jerusalem is one of the most complicated cities anywhere because they ask for diversity. They say, come, come to Jerusalem. Come to this city from all over the world, and we want you to be a part of Israel and Jerusalem. And he said, he said, Kay, I'm going to talk to you about something. He said, we're really worried about the United States. And I said, what is your worry? He said, there seems to be a lack of confidence, a lack of confidence. I said, lack of confidence here? He said, no, among the American people. They don't seem confident. They don't seem willing to, to take things on. He said, is the United States gonna give up its leadership? I said, of course not. And he said, I want you to understand, he said, the whole world looks at the United States. You're not just a superpower, but you're what we want to be. You're where we want to go. And he said, and the, the entrepreneurs of the world are in the United States. So the rest of us all look to the United States for that, that dynamic leadership. And you can't give it up. And I listened to it, and I talked through it, and, but then I, I kept going back to it in my mind. I thought, are we really losing confidence in ourselves? We can't do that. We can't do that as a city. We can't do that as a state. We can't do that as a nation because we really are the example to the rest of the world. And people don't swim across rivers and break the law to come into other countries. They come here to the United States, and they come to Texas, and they come to Fort Worth. And so I think we have, to, we have to think about that and say, certainly, let's be good stewards of our money. Certainly. 
but let's also make sure that we're building for the future and, and accepting our future as leaders. You're going to be, we're going to hand it off to you. And so I'm glad you're here thinking about those things. And thank you for letting me uh, give you my thoughts. Thank you. Did y'all have any questions for the Congresswoman? Anyone? Oh. I just wanted to ask, like you said, um, how the, how I guess what you were talking about is what we used to call the pork belly, right? And that's basically what they changed. How how do we as advocates and future leaders use our voice now to demand that power? How do we demand that power that has been passed on from the Congress to bring that to the local level so that we can raise our voices here at the local level to, I guess, gain consensus, like you said, regionally, statewide, nationally, for those projects that we know that we need to be working on for the future? First of all, understand the issue. That's why I talked to you about it, to understand the difference in investment and just spending and be able to be advocates to people who really don't understand that. Yes, we call them earmarks. Well, and we, we've said we're gonna stop this. I was in a meeting where, with the leadership of our conference, I said, who can tell me what an earmark is? We didn't even have a definition for it. It was just spending we don't like. Well, let's get a definition. Let's understand this. And I think, and then to advocate among people that you know for the process that says, those projects have to have local support. They have to be authorized by the Congress. They have to have public input. They have to have a payback. In other words, one of the things that we did with TRV at the very beginning was a feasibility study. You know, you can do anything if you've got enough money, but is there a payback? Well, $1.1 billion is a pretty good payback. Uh, so, so we put those reforms in there, but understand what the issue is and talk to people about it and stand up for it. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Along the same lines there, you mentioned there's federal discretion to help because right now so many projects have huge regional impacts. We have to approach it at a regional type of approach. You mentioned that right now at the local level, um, you know, bond programs also become increasingly difficult because of public confidence and other things. So what can this create right now help on the local level? We have a huge infrastructure need here locally right now. Right. Well, the way I understand what this group is doing is you're making suggestions for that. And so that the, it's just the first step to appear before the city council. You know, the rest of it is to follow through, and that's when it gets really tough. But the, this, this city, is, it's very proud of the work they've done, and so to become advocates again for that. And they're always looking for people to, to chair those, those public meetings. J.D., that's how he got involved with the water project. He chaired the downtown portion of all those public meetings that addressed Trinity Revision in the downtown, it's 88 miles of river, it's a huge project, but the downtown part receives the most attention. He chaired that, and so he got to help and listen to people and their input. Become really good listeners, because it's not just speaking for it, it's listening to get other people's input. Do you believe in this? Can we answer your questions? You know, what more can I get to you? But I would stay very involved. Thanks. Thank you. Before you sit down, we have a gift for you, Congresswoman. I'd like to oh, express our Thank you. <laughs> gratitude to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> um, we also would like to recognize Lacey as well. If you can come up here. <laughs> That's for you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And last but not least, Dr. Watson, we have a little something for you as well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and one last plug. Um, we have Leadership Fort Worth here today. Um, Jan and Harriet, can you wave your hands? Um, they have left flyers, um, brochures about the Leading Edge class. They are our partner um, for Steer Fort Worth and facilitate all of our task forces with us. And they are recruiting for the 2013 class. So if you're interested, please um, feel free to um, talk to Jan and Harriet. And there are several alumni in the the room, including myself and John. I saw John Horton here. There's John, so we can tell you all about it as well. Um, and then also in the program, we have several events coming up. We have our one year anniversary at Joe T's where we all got started. It's hard to believe it's been a year, but that's coming up. 
And we also have the DFW reception as well with uh, Jeff Bacon. So there's a lot of great partying, but we will get back to work in January. So, uh, <laughs> so thank y'all and um, have a great day.